What's in a name? Well, in Cleveland, there's a name change, but the team is eerily similar. I'm still going to probably call them Indians until, I don't know, June or July. But the Guardians' bats woke up the other day. And it's time to bring in Jeff Ellis of Locked On Guardians to talk about Cleveland. And one player from the town where my mother-in-law lives who is having an unbelievable start to his season. Hey, this is Locked On MLB. You are Locked On MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, baseball fans, and welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast we talk about all of Major League Baseball. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan, but as my lower third can show you right there, yeah, we do. You're going to call me, call me Sully. Thanks so much for making Locked On MLB your first listeners. We're available on all your free podcasting catchers. We're also available here on YouTube. Be my mug. I'm going to move myself a little bit back. That's how wide my face is. Only the biggest screen can capture the face of your pal, Sully. Today's episode is being recorded on the 11th day of April, 2022. Not sure when I'm going to drop it. May drop it later today. May drop it tomorrow morning. Depends on my mood. But the mood is good in Cleveland because the team's bats have a will. Oh, by the way, follow us on Twitter at Lockdown and it'll be pod. Same handle for Instagram. I'm your pal, Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter. Solid Baseball Podcast on Instagram. And be sure to tell your smart device to play podcast Locked On MLB or check out some of the other great podcasts on the Locked On Podcast Network where it is your team every day, including Locked On Guardians, hosted by friend of the podcast, Jeff Ellis, who must be happy with how the Guardians have played half of their games in the history of the team. But they had an interesting win today. And I wanted to bring a board and just sort of talk about how some things have unfolded, especially after the, the bats did not exist the first two games. But without further ado, hey, let's bring him in. Hey, Jeff Ellis, host of Locked on Guardians. That's what the lower third says right there. It must be true. How you doing, man? It's good. I mean, could we could we say the offense the last two days has taken a quantum leap? Nice. Very nice. I got that. I got that. Hey, um, first of all, thanks for thanks for returning to the show. Thanks for oh, coming thanks for back. having me on. Always fun. And uh, uh, look at I'm I have been unabashed that I am a supporter of all things uh, Cleveland sports. Uh, just simply because uh, why does my name say Luke? <laughs> I was noticing that. I wasn't going to say anything. But I was I noticing interesting. Um, hmm. I'm going to get rid of that. For if you're watching it, on, if you're watching it on the YouTubes, uh, for reasons unknown to me, I'm called Luke. Maybe, do you, am I a Jedi? I was like Star Wars referencing. I'm sorry, or, or it might be a Dukes of Hazard. I don't know. But do you want? Know it's not true. Do you know what my name actually is? My name is actually Paul Francis Sullivan or Sully. That's what the correct lower third says. Uh, but that's not important right now. What's important right now is. Uh, first of all, let's just address the first thing. Obviously, this is the first year that the the team has been called the Guardians. Um, a lot of controversy about that. And it seems like exactly what I thought was going to happen, what you thought was going to happen, happened. Uh, a few people will call them Indians for a little while, and after a while, it'll be the Guardians, and everyone's lives moves on. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a very, like, honestly, it's been less than 10 people. I mean, I would say my interactions on to, and yeah, I mean, I'll admit I've had some longtime followers go away because I was pro name change and that was just enough to trigger them. But, uh, bye bye then. Goodbye. Yeah. But, not, it, not needed. you know, there's a few people who keep popping up. I, you know, I'm, I, I'm not sure about the baseball sandwich that is the mascot. Um, but I do like, like, if you get a chance and you like, you know, things that are art deco, like every tweet, just the way that it is set up with the color pattern. Is actually pretty cool. Like the the mascot, eh, but like the the art style and their way they're leaning into it. Um, we've been debating on Twitter what we want to call them. Some people say G men. Some people say guards. I've been saying guards. I, I recently started pushing for the Cogs, Cleveland. Uh, let's see, what was my idea with this? Uh, Cleveland, Ohio Guardians, because Cog felt something like uh, you know part of a 
you could do some cool art deco things with it. They could be the cogs. Someone else really liked it. I, you know, I'm just throwing random things out there. I think when the biggest problem is, oh, we don't know what's a good way to shorten it. Uh, then that's a massive improvement over the biggest problem being, hey, this is racist. So, uh, you know, it's a minor problem. And I know I probably lost three more followers putting it that way. But that's kind of where we were. So, you know, and, and I've talked about many times on the show. I have a Chief Wahoo Christmas ornament that my grandmother gave me. My grandmother has passed. I'm not going to throw it away. I don't put it on the tree. No. But I, I understand, you know, it, it just kind of sits there every year. I kind of see it in the box of ornaments. I'm like, I oh, can't go up, but I'm not going to throw it. So it's that's where I kind of am. Like, you know, you I appreciate the history the of it. People don't but, erase the past. No. You just try to be better moving forward. That's all. Yes. And uh, again, the really the art design they are doing is fantastic. Uh, that is like the best part of this whole thing. So if you've been someone who hasn't checked it out, go check out the Cleveland Guardians Twitter. You'll see what they're doing. It, it's, it's really cool. That is the best part is this real art deco that they are leaning into. It's got kind of a noir feel when you look at things. If you're someone who likes kind of that, you know, uh, like I always like dark city, you know, go some yeah. sci-fi noir, or, or, like, you know, yeah, or kind of the way they had in the Tim Burton Batman. Yeah. They had the, uh, the, those statues around like the city hall and everything like that. Yeah. It was pretty amazing. Um, my, I think they should just call them the Deans. That way, the people want the old name and the new name. You get the Deans. Hey, how are the Deans doing? And everyone is unified with that. And then, like, you'll have people like my mom being like, "Are they called the Deans? Are they now the yes. Deans? Yeah, yeah, yes, they are. They're calling them like an old, you know, a term for a principal. The, the Deans. Go. I actually, you know what? I, I've always been pro name change, but I, I like the name. Gar I've always the minute I heard Guardians, I thought that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I like that it, it isn't just a random name like the Fighters. You know that there's it. You know it, there's a connection to Cleveland, and I don't know it, it. It it adds a new. It adds a freshness to the game, and I think the new the 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 hat looks cool. Looks close enough to the previous hat, and um, but different enough that it's 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 a fresh take. And and as I've said many many times. The name Indian and the logo Indians were not exactly good luck charms. Nope. As I've said before, in the wild card era, only two World Series Game 7s went to extra innings, and the Cleveland Indians lost both of them. What was uh, I think Chief Wahoo was adapted, adapted, no, adopted the year they won a World Series in 48. Yeah. So, yes, and then nothing after that. I mean, it yeah. was... So it was, and it wasn't just nothing. It was bad. Like, <laughs> follow this How team. How bad like, was it? How bad was it? Even in the major league movies, they didn't win the World Series. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, like, let's let's and the the not to bring up another franchise that has tortured the souls of Cleveland fans, but when the Denver Broncos changed their helmet from the D with the snarling horse to just the horse. Oh, what about the tradition of the, 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 the then they won back to back Super Bowls? Okay. All right. I think we're gonna be fine with it. We're gonna, we're all gonna be fine with it and everything. And you know what? I and I think they're they can be a fun team. So let's just enjoy the new name and uh you know and, and it's fine. I think that I, I do think that a lot of the the controversy for it were very loud people who dominated the conversation. And I don't ever think it was nearly as many people as the stories try to portray it to be. No. And it's, and that's what it comes down to. It's like, you and I had this discussion last year. It's like, there's this story and I tweeted out today and someone did like a 40 tweet thing. That's worth your time. But it's like, this was never meant to honor Louis Sakalaxis. That's, that's a fake story. If anything, it was like, the whole time he was in Cleveland and afterwards he was mocked. Like there was no honoring of him. That's, yeah. that's a false narrative that came later. They copied, they had a bankrupt owner copying the Boston Braves at the time, I believe yeah, who had just had awesome. a ton of success. It was just, you know, it was, they, they copied who was successful. I mean, I didn't even know, like I said, I, you can go to my Twitter from the 11th and, um, I should give the guy his credit and I can't think his name right now, but he does like, I didn't know that they were like, they were officially called the Molly Maguires for like six months in there before they became like the, the history is, is right out there. And I understand again, I understand and the thing I always say, if you're getting mad at me right now, I understand it is part of your history. And for someone who it's like, this is the team I grew up for. I understand that gets ingrained. That is hard to overcome, but I just don't think a mascot as is, is as important as like, someone else's feelings, I guess. To me, it's yeah. like, it's just easy to move on with, especially it's like, 
that's kind of my view, but I do under, like, I understand people who, who it hurts because, because of that. I mean, I, it's the only mascot I ever knew with this team, but I guess I'm just built differently. Like I, it's not triggering. It's not something that like really upsets me and I could just move on. It wasn't something that made me, you know, um, like I said, it wasn't something that triggered me. It didn't make me sad. It didn't make me, you know, a quote unquote, I, I guess I'm not a quote unquote snowflake because a mascot change didn't hurt my soul, but uh, that that's kind of where I am. In two or three years, people will look back and then, oh yeah, they were called the Indians. I forgot that. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. And do you want, sometimes things happen and you, you know, you, you make changes and you fix stuff and you fix stuff and you improve moving forward. It's kind of like when you have to pop the hood of your car and you got to make some changes in your car. And when I need to make changes in my car, I go to Rock Auto. And this episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. You know, with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for the local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. You know what? I've been having issues with my car. I've been having some things with the transmission. I've been having things with my battery. And guess who I called? I called rockauto.com. Do you know why? Because they have all the parts that I need. You could save money. You could save time. And in some ways, those are the same thing using Rock Auto. You know, some people are going to spend 30% more, 50% more, 100% more. I knew one person who spent 45,000% more than he needed to. He's not very good with money. But by going to Rock Auto, you can save that money. It's a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years, which is a strange sentence to say because I still think 20 years ago is 1980. But no. We had the internet 20 years ago. I'm old, but Rock Auto is younger than me and works on cars that are old or new. That's me trying to get back to the copy. They have everything you need from brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, even a new carpet. Go explore their easy-to-use website today to find the solution to your auto part needs. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right, lock on in there. How did you hear about this box so they know that we sent you? Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car are ever going to need are rockauto.com. Hey, thanks for making Locked On MLB your first listen. Have Locked On Guardians be your second listen. And then go to Locked On MLB Prospects. Host Lindsey Crosby, friend of this podcast, is a prospect encyclopedia, and he's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the show. We're here with... Jeff Ellis, host of Lockdown Guardians. Okay, enough of that talk, because there's some stuff happening in the, on the field. And my mother-in-law lives in Los Gatos, California, the birthplace of Mr. Kwan, the person who is getting hit after hit after hit after hit with the Guardians. And mind you folks, he is a real Guardian, because he never played a single game in the major leagues as an Indian. So at the back of his baseball card, will just say Guardians. But he has had an unbelievable start to his season. I mean, he, he's, I mean, he got eight hits in his first 10 at-bats. Oh, my God, his average fell all the way down to 692. But he got on base three times today, including a bases-clearing, back-breaking triple for, uh, the, for Cleveland over Kansas City. And the numbers of Stephen Kwan, who's, uh, you know, he's just can't stop getting on base and, and I believe has not swung and missed yet. I'm going to say, if he keeps up this pace for the whole year, he is going to break some records. Yeah, it's, I mean, he's already broken a few, if you want to look at some of the stuff out there that um, the previous record for most times reaching base in your first three games was 10 times. Uh, he had 12, so he was not, you know, he didn't go one over. He went two over a record that was established since 1901. Uh, what I was trying to, I, today with his single, uh, he has reached base 13 times, or no, it was a walk, that he had reached base 13 times in his first four MLB games. That tied Jay Bruce and Kaz Masui for the most times in, a, uh, in the first four career games since 1901 that was in the first inning he still had another walk and a triple after that to get 15 times in his first four games uh 26 swings zero misses like he's That's unbelievable and he didn't strike out once in spring training either so he has not had a strikeout so far in spring training or the big leagues and like i said then you just add that whole thing it's like not only is he not striking out he's not even swinging and missing um 
Zach uh, Meisel over at The Athletic had a great piece talking about him today. And I guess one of the things it's kind of interesting is like his parents loved pinball and he grew up around pinball machines. And I don't know if it's part of that has helped with the quick uh, reflexes and he's got to react. Um, you know, he was a guy that you go back to 2020. He wasn't invited to that minor league camp. Like sure. he was not not it's not like this is a a thing where they drafted him in the sixth round and expected this. Uh, he's he came out last year. And just he put the whole team on notice and now he's come up and, you know, it's he has reached base three times in every game except for Sunday where he reached base six times with five hits and a hit by pitch. He's got two doubles, one triple. He's he's doing it all. He's also stellar defense, made a few highlight uh, plays out there. He did drop one ball today, but the did other, he? yeah, he did. But but he but for the most part, yeah, I mean, for the most part. And they wound up working around that play anyway. And he he made up for it because he made that play, which was part of the Kansas City rally. But then he hit the back-breaking two-out, two-strike, bases-clearing triple that basically put the game away. And going into this year, I took a look at the Guardians, and I was very – and I talked about it on the podcast. I was very frustrated. I'm sure you were more frustrated than me. Uh, I was very frustrated by the fact that <clears throat> the team was was among the bottom three in terms of payroll. They're alongside Baltimore and Pittsburgh, who are not even trying. And everyone knows they're not trying. They know everyone knows there are going to be hundred lost teams. But uh, you look at Plesac and Bieber and Shivali and and these in Quantrill. You're looking at this team saying, "This is not a bad pitching staff," and this is not exactly. Uh, you know, like the NL West last year, where you had 200 win teams. I mean, you have the White Sox, who are a fine team, but they're not a juggernaut. And the idea of like, if you put a mediocre lineup with that pitching staff, they'll win 85, 86 games, which might be enough to be one of the wild card teams. Or better yet, if Chicago has a stumble, like Minnesota did last year, they may be even able to leapfrog them into the into the division. And so the idea that they were not even putting a team out there I thought was really super frustrating but if there's any hope for a team like the Guardians um, it's going to be for unexpected production from players and Quan is the ultimate example of that yeah there you know if you believe the the hype which you know you never know what to to make of the rumor but it's like they were in on Winker and Olsen they didn't end up getting either of them and it was like unless they could get a sure upgrade that the guardians just weren't interested. And I, I talked about that when it's been a hard off season because it seemed yeah. like the guardians were asleep at the wheel. It, it did. It's like when I saw the Austin Meadows trade, I was like, Oh, great. Not because he was going to the tigers. Like I think Austin Meadows is a very kind of limited player, but he still would have been an upgrade for the guardians to get me wrong. But I was like, this is going to be it. My Twitter is not going to be fun. And everyone was just waiting for them to do things and they didn't do anything. And I was talking about on the show at some point, they have to show some kind of commitment. This is a team that finished second in the division. They were under 500, but not a ton under 500. Uh, their number two hitter missed eight weeks. Their ace only had 16 starts. Every single starter missed at least six weeks with injury or due to ineffectiveness. And then, I mean, the biggest free agent loss was Blake Parker. Like, this is not a team yeah. that really lost anything. It's a team that was a little bit below 500 and had really bad, you know, injury record. It was very clear. It's like they need a first baseman. They need a catcher. They need an outfielder. Uh, the hope was maybe Quan would get a chance, but we have not seen them break camp with a lot of rookies through the year. So we kind of figured we we're going to end up with like Zimmer and Mercado out there. And, uh, you know, fortunately that didn't happen. They let Quan play. And now it's like, now the excitement is building, right? Cause it's like, he is playing well. Um, they, George, you know, Valera is in double A and he's probably the top prospect in system. You know, Gabriel Arias was awesome all spring. They've, they've got arguably, they don't have the blue chip talent. They're not full of like top 40 prospects in baseball, but in terms of depth, they're one to 30 matches up with anyone. They have so much depth and that's really yeah. what we're going to start to see coming. I mean, people forget about Nolan Jones and it's like, he was, he's banged up again, but it's like, if he can get healthy, uh, that could be a first baseman. That could be an outfielder. They've got so many young pieces. Uh, it, it's going to be interesting. And it, the question now becomes, you know, can they do enough to, you know, who's going to be available at the deadline? 
now that Jose Ramirez is, is resigned, you know, the big star of the deadline is staying in Cleveland. What else can they do from here? Or do they just continue with this approach? Are they going to try, they've locked up three players in the last seven days. Are they going to keep trying to lock up their own players, use that money internally and rely on prospects? Tell the good listeners out there who the three players they locked up. Obviously, Jose Ramirez was the big one. He's the, yeah. the marquee player on their team. So Jose Ramirez is seven years guaranteed. So he's yeah. the one who's seven years. He's in Cleveland. Emmanuel Classe, who arguably was the top reliever in baseball a year ago, who yeah, he was, wonderful uh, last year. was the, you know, they got him for that one inning. The Texas got of Corey Kluber. That was mm-hmm. class A was the return. He signed a five-year contract with two option years at the end that are between 10 to 13 million which again, if he does what he does last year, it's easy things to pick up, especially in like seven years as we see the closer market continue to escalate upwards. Uh, and then Miles Straw, who anyone who's a longtime listener of Lockdown Guardians knows I've been talking about trading for him almost since I started on the podcast. And I'm going to do episode 700 next week. Mm-hmm. Uh, Straw is what is fun right now is if you, we talked about Steve Kwan doesn't miss last year in terms of uh, swinging strike percentage, the lowest players with swinging strike percentages in baseball. Um, Ramirez was second. Miles Straw was eighth. And now you add Quan to it. So Straw doesn't swing and miss. He's an averageish bat. He'll probably be good for 30 stolen bases, but he's, I, I think, pretty consistently a top four to five, maybe top three defensive center fielder. So they got themselves set it. They got an MVP middle of the order bat locked up. They got an elite level closer. And then they got a center fielder, which we saw center fielders on this free agent market get overpaid and quickly yeah. grabbed up. So they locked those play guys up. The, the new targets are... Probably uh, Quantrell and Franmo Reyes. I think most of us expect Bieber is an impossibility at this point. Right. Um, so he's the, you know, if you want to talk Shane Bieber, I think this offseason it could happen. But I think we'll see them continue to try to do more of what they've done because the new CBA makes it more advantageous to lock guys up. You can't get those guaranteed three cheap years. Right. Um, can I ask just, this is my own ignorance. I didn't know straw was locked up. That was my, how I phrased mm-hmm. that question was uh, uh, my, my bluffing there. Cause I know about Ramirez, I knew, but I did, I didn't know about the straw. So yeah, what, got, what was uh, the, the straw signing? Five years, 25 million. So he gets I mean, five. How did I, I totally missed that. Sa- I don't uh, it happened like, was it Saturday? I think it was, it was one of those days. Um, okay. but yeah, you got, you go. and then, uh, the option years are 8.5 and 8.5. So very cheap for a potential yeah, that, starting that's out. Great. That's great. That's nothing. And what I talked about on the show is the idea that like, he's probably never going to make a ton. Cause like, you're really looking at like a league average bat, but, uh, if he starts winning hardware, if he starts winning gold gloves, then his arbitration values jump through the roof. So it all comes down to that hardware point of it. And now he's locked up. So they don't even have to worry about it. So it's, two team options at 8.5 and then just only 5 million a year. Uh, class A's was like something like that as well. I mean, except for his option was 10 with a chance to get up to 13 and Jose Ramirez's was really team friendly as well. Uh, so they're in a position where hopefully this is just, like I said, this is the start. Well, and the other thing is if you have a team that's pitching centric to know that you have center field locked up with a really good, you know, you know your defense is going to be good. In some of these spots, I think that that's that's really solid. Um, we we'll talk a little bit when we come back from the break about the offense that exploded after two rough games to start the season, offensive wise. They woke up for the last two, and I think there's some very very encouraging things about their pitching staff that we see. Which I think that if there's a Cleveland Guardians game going on, I think it's a surefire bet that the scoring is going to be low, maybe on both sides. Hey, if you want to make any bets, go to betonline.net. It's your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. Find all the best sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's basketball playoffs and the start of the Major League Baseball season. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sporting wagering info from live betting, playoffs, eSports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. BetOnline.net is where the game starts. Um, hey, I didn't remove uh, Jeff Ellis's lower third when I did that ad read, but that's fine. That's fine. Jeff Ellis from Locked On Guardians is our host. Or, or no, he's our guest. I'm the host. I'm the host. Paul Francis Sullivan. There's my lower third. Um, you know things are getting punchy when I start, uh, you know, miss using words and everything like that. Uh, first game of the year on Thursday. The they lost three to one to Kansas City. 
Then they lost one nothing in extra innings in the second game. And so is that moment of, oh, boy, they've scored one run in their first 19 innings. Things do not look good. Then they scored 17 runs in the next nine innings and picked up. They scored 27 runs. The, they scored one run the first two games and 27 runs the next two games. Um, that's at least in, slightly encouraging that things are going their way in terms of their bats waking up. Quan, of course, had the great game, but you also saw Straw. Um, he, he got a position where he scored three times. Jose Ramirez went three for three. He homered. Mercado hit a grand slam. He got four hits. Owen Miller went three for four. Uh, I said Mercado drove in five. I know we're not supposed to look at RBIs, but that was yesterday's game. And on Monday's game, uh, Mercado uh, hit another home run. Uh, Miller went three for five again. Rosario went two for five again. Uh, Reyes went two for five. Um, and Miller hit a double. And of course we had already talked about, um, uh, and Ramirez drove in a run and we've talked about Quan and straw. So granted it's Kansas city, but, uh, there's still a major league team. And, uh, when you consider how badly this thing's got started, uh, heading to Cincinnati, even two, two is not so bad. No, not at all. And it's, you know, you go back to both of those games they had and there was, yeah, the pitching kind of came undone. And uh, I mean, even today's game, Class A had issues. So we'll have to track that uh, as he picked up the loss. But it was, you know, also the extra inning junk. But yeah, it's one of those, when you look at this team, we knew there was Jose Ramirez and Fran Mil Reyes. And after that, it was just, uh, we, you know, we thought Ahmad, Ahmed Rosario would be about league average. Uh, but he's also, I mean, he's going to be a free agent on the same schedule that Jose was going to be. So there's some curiousness if he's even long for Cleveland we'll have to see it is a situation where uh first base is a mess it looks like Owen Miller is going to get first opportunity to kind of go there and stick and we'll see how it goes uh the outfield is still so undetermined outside of you know in that Mercado spot where he did go deep again today but you're really hoping essentially it's like you have Straw, Quan, Ramirez, uh, Reyes, Rosario, and that's one to five. And then six to nine, uh, you know, it's just, uh, who knows? I mean, all of those are, we, I mean, I've sat here on the show and talked about why, like, I expected Jimenez to have a big bounce back. Um, so far, it hasn't happened. Catcher is is really ugly. Uh, we've been hoping for, like, uh, some kind of improvement uh, or trade at that position. We'll have to see. But, yeah, they, getting... Uh, getting the top of the lineup going has has totally been the thing. And, you know, Fran Mill was not good in those first two games. He's been a big part of the turnaround. Also just, I mean, Quan started batting, I want to say seventh. And after the first game, they moved him to two. So if you look at it that way, it was uh, since Quan's moved into the the second spot, it's been, they've averaged nine runs a game. So uh, of course, one of those was a zero, but yeah, it's at least, I mean, a year ago, when I was sitting there looking at like the runs created plus and just talking about like who are league average bats on this team, you had Jose Ramirez, you had Fran Moon, you had Miles Straw, and that was about it. Uh, and Ahmed Rosario, like he was slightly below. Adding Quan just completely changes that. And then, like I said, we're just kind of waiting to see on some of these young guys. Uh, the starting pitching is going to be hopefully improved. I mean, it's the one thing is like last year they had to get a lot of innings that had like JC Mejia, who they DFA at the end of the year, they had Sam Henches, who's now in the pen had to be a starter. And even the depth, um, you know, Eli Morgan was throwing 93 instead of 90. Uh, so it's like, well, okay. He's the sixth starter, but man, if you need another relief arm, he's looking really good for that role. And it's the guardians. So there's that next set of arms are already starting to hit. They've got the guys who are coming up and it's going to be interesting to see what they do in terms of, it's still lineup that needs help unless Owen Miller is for real. Unless uh, something happens, you know, Lavastida turns out that he can do a little bit more catcher, but he's probably being rushed. So there's still a team that could use some help. So it'll be curious to see if they finally, because their 40 man is an absolute disaster. They're doing things they've never wanted to do before. Like, like putting, what, for example, so they have two players who have never played in the big leagues and they put them on the 60 day disabled list because they needed to clear spots. They never do that. They kept Carlos Vargas off the disabled list all last year, even though he's never pitched above a ball because they never want to start that clock early. And once you put a guy on the 60 day disabled list, it counts as service time. 
Um, and it also burns an option year. So it like, well, it's maybe not service time. Maybe it's just the burning of the option year. I have to think, but they've always avoided it. They had to do it twice this year. So at some point they still need to sit back and trade three or four guys on this roster for one. So I still think at some point an upgrade can come, you know, especially because there are a lot of, you know, Jose Tenya is a top 10 prospect. You'll see a lot of places who's just, who's never played above a ball, but like, I think he led the AFL in uh, batting average last year. They've got guys like that that are far away and this like glut of middle infielders. So if they can start, I've been saying this for a year plus and <laughs> been wrong, but at some point they got to do something because they're just, they got no room. Do you think that maybe if there's, you know, I know they're not usually buyers, but if they have, you know, they, they have so many arms. If they could take one of their minor league arms, one of the glut of middle infielders, and like maybe one player who needs to be replaced in the major league level, you, I mean, they could be in a position, I'm not, maybe not to pull off a blockbuster, but to bring in a major league player or two. I mean, we saw what happened with Atlanta last year by filling holes, by making sure, all right, let's make sure there's a major leaguer everywhere. And, of course, they caught lightning in a bottle with, you know, Soler and uh, Rosario becoming the big uh, heroes of the postseason. Um, but, yeah, I think there's a lesson to be learned there, which is, you know, put major leaguers around the field and positive things can happen. Or maybe those major leaguers could be the spark for a couple of those young players you know, coming up, I don't know, but like, I, I think the, the guardians might be in a position to be responsible buyers as opposed to recklessly trading away prospects. Kind of like when the, the you know, trading away Fernando with the white Sox trading with Fernando Tatis Jr. But also using James those Shields ex- wasn't yeah. enough. Yeah. Not enough. No. But when you have, when you have some excess in your farm for, at certain positions, you might be able to turn this around. I mean, I, as I, I, I know I'm a broken record, but this is a winnable division and they have some of the pieces to win it. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think, you know, when we did our crossovers, uh, it, it was very clear that, you know, everyone kind of viewed, and it, it's a thing a year ago, everyone viewed the guardians as fourth place in the division last year. They kind of view them fourth place this year. And I'm like, this is a team that doesn't go away and it's got the pitching and it's got one of the best players in baseball and it's got enough interesting pieces and it's got a pay and they've got a payroll of 60 million. It's like if, if they went out and added just a, a little bit more and added some legitimate, you know, it's like, we've been kind of praying for like the Ian Hap Wilson Contreras deal uh, because then, Hey, that that's catcher Hap worked um, extensively with Chris Valeca, who's the new hitting coach. He knows both of those guys. Well, like that's the deal that makes sense. Uh, the Cubs went out and signed former guardian Jan Gomes. So they, you know, they have catching depth for days. Contreras is a free agent to be like, if you can go and do that deal responsibly and maybe trade like three prospects, you know, all from your 40 man or two from your 40 man and another guy you're going to have to add at the end of the year, because you're going to have to add another player. Like it doesn't get any easier. Like they have, un- I guess, unfortunately, fortunately done super well in Latin America that they have these classes where they have to add a bunch of guys at once because they're all, you know, prospects of of value that they're afraid of losing. Joey Cantillo, I will stand was the number two piece in the Mike Clevenger deal at the time. He has struggled with health, but they didn't have space for him. Like if there was a rule five, he wouldn't be in Cleveland anymore. And there's no way he'd be in Cleveland still, but there was no rule five. So they get another year to look at him, but that's a, that's a situation where they, they have to, they, they should be responsible buyers just because, they need, you know, it's like the Rays, you know, the Rays, we see people bagged on them for Meadows, but they got, you know, they keep pushing it down the line. They get more assets. They got that draft pick. They get a million dollars extra to spend on the draft with that. Uh, they go out and they trade these, you know, it's, I mean, that's in some respects, like trading for far away assets is you talk about the White Sox. That's what, how Tampa got Fernando Tatis. You know, he was just a kid who was really far away and the lotto ticket, it's a one in a million lotto ticket work for San Diego. So if you just keep getting chances, that's better than like eventually, you know, the Anthony Castro for Bradley Zimmer is fine, but like, I don't know Castro, how much he really has to give for this organization. You know, if he's going to be, he's got some interesting peripherals, but uh, I'd rather just see them make a move where they can get future assets and, or do that smart trade. Well, look at. I'm hoping it's going to be an interesting year because I just, you know, the using my suffering index, 
the Cleveland fans are the most suffering fan base in all of baseball, with the possible exception of Montreal. And Montreal doesn't even have a damn team. So let's hope the Guardians can do what the Indians could not, which was close the deal here in the wild card era. But hey, we're here with Jeff Fellas of Lockdown Guardians. Jeff, where can people follow you and listen to your podcast? Uh, you know, you can follow me on the at Jeff MLB draft. I do a lot on the draft as well. Uh, Lindsay and I are already planning for the draft show this year and some more crossovers. So if you want some draft content, that is every Wednesday on the show, Wednesday wrap up uh, where I kind of talk about some top performers and then, uh, you know, Lockdown Guardians, wherever you get podcasts and uh, on the YouTubes. And uh, yeah, I appreciate uh, you having me on here. Yep. And it was great having you on. Uh, everyone else, you can follow me. You hear on the see right there in the lower three. You can follow me on Twitter at Sully Baseball. My Instagram handle is Sully Baseball Podcast. Follow this show at Locked On MLB Pods on both Twitter and on Instagram. Hey, talking about the Guardians, it's not so hard to say here on the 11th day of April 2022 with Jeff Ellis of Locked On Guardians. This has been Locked On MLB. And I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully.